Mise, Shaughnessy versus United States ex rel Mise, M-E-Z-E-R. Uh, Mr. Mise, a resident of Buffalo, uh, had immigration status and complex presence in the United States that he screwed up by leaving the country uh, for personal reasons briefly. And on his way back in, was detected and detained on Ellis Island and was a sort of prisoner in limbo on Ellis Island, seeking Supreme Court habeas review. The court in that case upholds the president's detention authority. It's a complex immigration decision. But four justices dissent. Black and Douglas in a broad, sweeping, liberty-focused dissent. And Frankfurter and Jackson, not joining their opinion, but voting with them, with Jackson writing separately. Uh, in an individual prisoner-focused liberty interest dissent. What I love about that one is that Jackson, maybe with ego, but with relevance, cites directly his cross-examination of Hermann Goering to talk about preventive detention and perpetual imprisonment as a tool used by the Nazis. And Jackson distinguishes rule of law systems like ours from that kind of behavior. A ninth case, United States versus Carragher. I mention this because it's relevant again. It's always been relevant. Article 1 includes a congressional taxing power. Congress has the power to tax. And in the Carragher case, the Supreme Court abandons the conceptual line drawing that had been part of its law earlier in the 20th century to try and define limits on congressional power. Basically, if Congress is raising money in a way that's not extremely disproportionate, that has penalty or regulatory effects but still generates revenue, Congress can do it and it's not for the court to say no. You see the Carragher case cited in Chief Justice Roberts' tax power section of the opinion and Jackson's concurring opinion in Carragher, much like his Richard B. Filburn opinion regarding the Commerce Clause, lays that all out. I want to finish with a tenth area that's a couple of cases. Um, this shows you some levity among the justices of the Vincent Court. And this, well, does anybody recognize that place? I don't know if there's much California in the room. That's the tower of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University on the campus. And that's Jackson dedicating a new building at Stanford in the summer of 1950. I focus on Stanford because I want to give you a couple of words about a man named Charles Fair, who is a huge figure in American constitutional history and constitutional law and Nuremberg. Charles Fairman was a political science professor at Stanford, who by co-appointment also taught in Stanford Law School. In the war years, Fairman became Colonel Fairman and served in the JAG Corps in Washington, D.C. And a brilliant legal thinker, became a sort of rule of law, war crimes specialist. Thus, when Nuremberg started, he was pulled over to Germany and became the senior legal advisor to the commander of the theater, Edward Betts. And there meets Jackson and works extremely closely with Jackson and Lucius Clay and his chief legal advisor, Charles Fay, and others on the prosecution of war criminals, the international trial, and the subsequent proceedings. Indeed, Charles Fairman, history doesn't give him credit yet for this, is the father, the intellectual father, of the subsequent proceedings that Telford Taylor prosecutes. Now, Charles Fairman comes back from Germany, too, and resumes being a professor at Stanford. Uh, and is a Jackson friend, acquaintance becoming a friend, uh, and is teaching people like an undergraduate named William Rehnquist who served in the Army Air Corps and ends up at Stanford in the late 1940s and so forth. This is a telegram that Bob Jackson said, sent to Charles Fairman in 1950. It's very short, it's hard to read. It says, letter received, keep praying. What was going on at the Supreme Court in the spring of 1950? Yes, race. Always has been going on in the Supreme Court, of course. We talked about Korematsu, Dred Scott, etc. This is our constitutional firmament's most defining, awful, unsteady piece of ground, if you will. Our first constitution and our second constitution blew this. Our third constitution after the Civil War uh, began to address this. And the Supreme Court in the late 1940s and in the spring of 1950 is beginning to deliver. And Robert Jackson, a judge, a lawyer, a man of honest legal argument, knows that there's no legitimate claim that the framers of the 14th Amendment intended to rule out segregation. They'd segregated the D.C. schools simultaneously. Uh, they had 
lots of things that indicated their superiority and inferiority views of whites and African Americans. And now Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP are challenging, in a series of cases, segregation systems, restricted covenants, graduate school, law school, and you know where we're going. And Charles Fairman, corresponding with Robert Jackson, Professor Fairman and Justice Jackson, uh, have this exchange. And this is Fairman's letter. I, I'll go to the next page because it's the line Jackson's referring to. Fairman's going on and on, and this is page 11, I think, of a very long letter, where he's concluding, and he said, uh, I beg leave to pray again on it, and further thought, and I may think of something better to pray for. He's gone through a long legal argument about why the 14th Amendment prohibits racial segregation, but says, you know, I'm thinking about this too, I'm working on this legal argument, I'm just a professor, I'll continue to pray on it. And Robert Jackson responded to that, with a telegram that said, keep praying. And when Robert Jackson works out what the Supreme Court works out, in this spring of 1950, Sweat versus Painter, McLaurin versus Oklahoma, Henderson versus ICC, is really the invalidation of race-based segregation. It takes a new chief and a few more years, and the ultimate litigation of numbers in elementary and secondary schools for the Brown case to come to the Supreme Court. And what Judge Jackson and the other justices following the leadership of Earl Warren come back to is literally the language of the Constitution. Sometimes the Constitution doesn't need to spell out much beyond a clear, simple, declarative conferral of power or protection what it's about. Equal protection of the laws means equal protection of the laws. Power to regulate interstate commerce, power to tax, I would say, mean that and not much more. And what Jackson in his judging does, of course, in this race area, and what the correspondence with Fairman illuminates, is we have seen what the alternative is about. We in Germany, we in Nuremberg, we prosecuting Hitler and henchmen know where racist ideology leads. And of course, Jackson had worked that out for himself in Korematsu in 1943 and 1944. And in the Brown case, the last major decision of Robert Jackson's life, May of 1954, um, he and a unanimous court come back to literally the Constitution, uh, which sometimes is a great and powerful fact. Thank you very much. <laughs>